Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. As intensified fighting around Syria's northern town of Aleppo brought about an end to a cessation of hostilities brokered by Moscow and Washington, international players are seeking ways to salvage the already eradicated ceasefire, which was initially believed to be a spark of light at the end of a long and dark tunnel. Now that the foundation to UN broker talks are on the verge of collapse in Geneva, senior diplomats are calling to re-evaluate the situation and find ways to keep the momentum for the political process ongoing. Today we will discuss the complexities of the negotiations and seek options for a political solution. And with me in the studio to do so are Dr. Neil Bombs, a research fellow at the Moshe Dayan Center of Tel Aviv University. Welcome. Thank you. I'd like also to welcome our TV7 analyst, Mr. Amir Oren. And Dr. Mordechai Kedar, a research fellow at the Begin Sadat Center for Strategic Studies at Barilan University. Welcome. Give me a little bit of an understanding, Mr. Oren. Is this really a complex situation with no light at the end of the tunnel, or are we now at the verge of being able to get the international community more involved and substantiate some kind of move that will bring results? It's very complex because it's a multi-actor game, indeed a page out of a game theory textbook. Syria is no longer a nation state. Perhaps it will never be a nation state again. It's a theater of war. And in a theater of war, the various components, the various actors do not cease fighting until and unless they understand that uh, it is better for them. And we have not reached that stage yet. Dr. Bones, how do you perceive this? Well, we have been here in the studio uh, in February when the agreement uh, was conceived and signed, cessation of hostilities. And I think we predicted then uh, that it will do two things. The first, it will try to buy some time for the side. And second, that it will fail and prove that uh, the diplomatic uh, solution may not be possible. And I think this is what we have seen. Um, a little over two months uh, following its uh, uh, its inception, and we have begun to see its ultimate uh, collapse. Uh, and uh, the different sides still have some uh, interest to try and keep some of it alive. Uh, Americans would like to see uh, the, their point about uh, the diplomacy still has a way to work, and they don't want to have more noise before uh, the election and election season. Uh, and uh, the Russians uh, are, are winning and are using this to their advantage. So they don't have a, an interest to really uh, have the hell break loose. And they're happy to keep things as they are as long as it works to their advantage. Dr. Kedar, how do you view this? Well, I think that uh, nobody has a realistic end game. Even if we had a ceasefire, which was kept by the sides, no, nobody really wants to have Assad in, in power forever. Nobody sees any way to regain the sovereignty of Assad all over Syria after a large parts of it are, are occupied by the Islamic State. So when nobody knows where, you, where to go from the negotiations, nobody can take the negotiations seriously. The problem is that the world doesn't know where to go. I would suggest that the world should at least take the situation on the ground and try to go forward to a solution which will divide the state to the powers which you can already detect. You can, like, Alawistan in, in the northwest, Druzistan in the southwest, uh, an Islamic state, let it be, uh, in the east, some Kurdish entity in the north with contiguity, without contiguity, but definitely we have to look at the, what the situation and nobody is taking serious steps in order to change the negotiation, the, the situation. So let it be and continue, take the, the, the situation on the ground and follow it. Mr. Oren, how detached from reality are the international community when it comes to Syria? I mean, at the, the beginning of the whole collapse of the cessation of hostilities, we saw the international community with UN Special Envoy to Syria, Staffan de Mistura, and US Secretary uh, of state, John Kerry and Lavrov and so on and so forth, all were saying, oh, we're worried about the cessation of hostilities rather than, okay, the cessation of hostilities is over. What can we do now? Now we hear them trying to salvage the cessation of hostilities, which is a partial cessation of hostilities as the battles are ongoing against all the Islamic State and uh, Jabhat al-Nusra and all the other organizations affiliated with Islamist uh, organizations. 
But at the same time, we don't really see a concrete move of reevaluating the situation and really understanding the core issues of implementing a mechanism that can actually work. How is this working around? The various sides uh, are reevaluating, but uh, each side does it for himself or itself. Uh, because they do not have identical interests, you do not see a common picture of what is happening on the ground and, uh, more importantly, the end game, as Dr. Piedar uh, has mentioned. Now, eventually, there will be some division of power, whether it will be geographical, some autonomous regions, some uh, federated uh, structure, whether it will be functional, uh, perhaps an Assad for the time being, uh, staying in the presidency with uh, some power over the military and security and others uh, controlling the parliament, this remains to be seen. But uh, what is uh, more important to see is that when you have so many actors and you can't find a formula, you have to subtract some of the actors. And the Islamic State and Jabhat al-Nusra are the prime candidates for this uh, subtraction. Now, go back to World War II, if you will. When the uh, Americans and others invaded France on D-Day, they did not fight France. They fought in France. For the Americans, Syria is now the Western Front of the fight, the campaign against the Islamic State, with Iraq being the Eastern Front. They want, first of all, to triumph over the Islamic State. It's important for President Obama politically. Obviously, he's uh, going out. He wants to do it with a bank. To maintain a legacy. Definitely. And uh, even if we found, if they found a solution for Syria, and um, there will be a ceremony, and people will sign it, and will hug each other, and uh, hopefully will not strangle, strangle each other as they are hugging, uh, um, nevertheless, the next day, they will have to keep this arrangement. And of course, there will be militias and organizations and groups um, who are not going to comply with it. So governance after the agreement is reached and implemented is uh, no less important than reaching the agreement. Now, the Mister and others understand it full well. So they are now bidding for time while they are hoping that the Islamic State can be taken out of Raqqa its capital, which is in Syria, uh, all the while in Iraq, the fight is uh, reaching Mosul. And hopefully by the end of this year, conditions on the ground will be better for uh, an agreement. But it will not be an agreement imposed from outside and then people rearranging the chairs around the uh, table. This is a question I'd like to ask you, Dr. Bombs. Uh, we hear the concerns both from Dr. Kedar and Mr. Oren on the matter of uh, the formation of what may happen after the agreement is uh, uh, signed or some kind of interim agreement which will bring about a certain change of geographic or leadership uh, capabilities and sovereignty. But at the same time, we're seeing on the one hand, Russia, which is backing uh, the second largest uh, power in Syria to date, uh, the, the government of President Bashar Assad. And at the same time, we have two other main powers, which is the Islamic State and the Kurds, which are not backed really by any international force. But at the same time, we see the meager force of the opposition, which is backed by the United States and its allies of the U.S.-led coalition against the Islamic State, which doesn't really have substantial swathes of land in its control. It doesn't really have any uh, leverage, if you will, with regard to what's going on in Syria. Would we see or could we see the international community backed by the United States moving its uh, support from the opposition forces towards the Kurdish uh, forces, for instance? So I think well, for sure we could see it. The question is, would we? Uh, I think the Russian example actually substantiate the fact that you can take a, actually a meager and a very weak force that has been very much in the decline, and you can actually save them, and that's the Assad regime, and turn it into becoming on the victorious side. Uh, and if we compare the Russian approach in this regard to that of the Americans, then Russian support as a proxy support, well, we have weapons, we have significant funding, we have pilots, we have airplanes, we have advisors, and at some point we actually have the Russians taking the lead with their own military command. 
And on the other hand, uh, we have the American support with a form of two uh, command centers, the MOC, the MOX, and then recently we've heard that 250 uh, soldiers will come to the rescue of the rebels. Uh, and this is, really helps explain why do we have uh, progress uh, on, on, on the various sides. Just to remind you that in the first half of 2015, uh, the rebels were actually uh, experienced quite significant progress, uh, particularly, by the way, in the south, where um, the rebels still today hold a fairly significant, uh, you know, regional uh, reach that is still, despite the Russian uh, um, bombings uh, that, are, that are basically still there. Not to forget, however, that a lot of this progress was made after alliances were struck with Islamist organizations defined by the international community as terrorist organizations, however. True, but I think that uh, the, still the majority of uh, Jabhat Janoubiya, the Free Syrian Army in the south, uh, is not Islamist by its core, and this and, and this Even is though also part of it is the Jesh al Islam, which is declared to find a Muslim country and and uh, focus on changing everything into the Sunni Muslim Sharia and and power. Part, part of it, part of it is, and that uh, brings uh, the opposition. That's also a part of why the overall fragmentation. I mean, the, even just the southern Syrian allies is comprised of about fifty different fractions. Uh, that all each have uh, uh, independent command and independent hierarchy, and they have a loose connection under the umbrella that is funded eventually by the Saudis, the Jordanians, and the uh, and the Americans. Uh, so that hierarchy, hierarchy has is not really a match, even from a military perspective, to uh, one. Uh, military that is still functioning with the help of a Hezbollah proxy and, and Russian control. Uh, this is part of the, the reasons why the two forces are not, uh, are not a match. But I'm saying even with all of that, the, internal, the external support here is very significant. The Americans have so far demonstrated that they still would like to lead from behind, that they still like to default to diplomacy. Even when it fails, it tries to show now to negotiate this another uh, as we've heard today, another uh, ceasefire in two different cities, but leaving Khaleb so the, the the battle could continue over there. And the rebels, of course, have commented into that and says, look, this is something uh, that is really mm. absurd, even if you try to put it on the table. Just for the sake of our viewers, Khaleb is uh, the city of Aleppo, the Arabic term for it. Dr. Kedal, I, I would like to also get the understanding how much of a coordinated mechanism is set in place after uh, Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov of Russia announced that there is no cooperation between NATO, the United States, the European Union with the Russian Federation on the one hand, after which just earlier this week, Kerry and Lavrov met in Geneva and have had some kind of agreement with regarding to trying to set a mechanism in place in order to reach a certain cessation of hostilities? Look, I think that nobody in this scene takes the Americans in the West seriously, especially after what happened two days ago when Assad again used chemical weapons. Again. Excuse me? Does he still have them? After the agreement which the Americans broke with the with the Russians, that they will take out all the chemical weapons which he had, and everything will be disbanded. And he and he actually committed himself not to use them anymore. And here again, he's killing people with chemical weapons, not chlorine, really, sarin. So who takes Americans seriously after they made sure that he doesn't have any more of these weapons? So this is what happens when nobody takes the Americans and the West and the Westerners. Seriously, nobody cares about what they agree. Just to point agree. out, though, that this uh, information was given by the organization, which is based in London, to observe the situation in Syria. And Look, the allegations weren't yet brought forward by the United Nations. I, I read which, it in the Israeli media. I please. think it's serious. It appeared in Haaretz as a headline of the day, yesterday, I believe. And then, okay, I take it, uh, you know, on face value. I'm not trying to to find other, other explanations. But if this is really what happened there, so everything which we agreed, by the way, with Iran, maybe as well, maybe the agreements there will be also kept like the chemical uh, agreement in, in Syria. Again, a question mark on, on the American administration, on the West, on Western, Western uh, 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 bodies like uh, NATO and others. So the whole thing is, it looks so fragile and so un, unreal. 
when you see what happens. So who, who takes it seriously? Mm-hmm. I, I, Mr. Beg, I beg to differ. Please. Uh, yes, Assad has probably used chemical uh, weapons, which he uh, should have had at all. But he did it against the Islamic State, which is considered an enemy of world order per se, not only of a certain regime, which the United States is also against, but because the Islamic State is anathema to everyone. There is no negotiation with it. There is no common ground. And the Americans, which, of course, use the atomic bomb against Japan under extreme circumstances, could understand why Assad chose this particular adversary, not the other opposition groups after the agreement, to use chemical weapons. And the Americans are not necessarily against it. I, I would like to hear your comment on this, Dr. Bums, and then uh, in addition to this, I would like to understand, with so many international interests implemented in Syria right now, we're talking about the Russians and the Americans opposing one another. We see Saudi Arabia and Iran, on the other hand. We see Turkey also playing a big role. We see Jordan playing a big role with Nasser Judah, their foreign minister, flying to the United States and having those meetings with regarding to the situation. We see Israel in close co- uh, cooperation or coordination with the Russians on the matter of Syria, many interests are playing out. Many uh, voices are made in order to try and keep strategic interests of each player with regarding to Syria. How do we really, uh, how are we able to reach a certain cessation of hostilities which will suffice each player in this arena? So let's backtrack for a second and, and remind ourselves how it all began. Uh, the Syria uh, war began as a civil war. It began as a part of what at some good old past just a few years ago, we used to call the Arab Spring. It developed. And at the beginning, we had the very clear enemy. Uh, and that enemy was the regime. Soon enough, after the Americans have made their first significant back turn not to bomb um, Syria, uh, we have the beginning of uh, the appearance of other players and other proxy players, and then we have the appearance of the Islamic State that become the ultimate enemy. When the Islamic State becomes the ultimate enemy, Assad becomes in many ways the lesser enemy. Now we have more interest to make sure that we'll keep a certain balance, and perhaps because we need to fight the Islamic State, we may even buy, and some of the Americans did buy, at least as an excuse, that argument, well, you know, I am here uh, to, with the help of the Russians to fight the Islamic State. And I'm even willing to give, uh, a, uh, to give a cessation of hostilities and to make sure that the Russians will continue to fight uh, the Islamic State, although we know that uh, once they have uh, established themselves in Syria, the first targets were actually the American-supported rebel groups. And uh, even those in the United States, in the CIA, who said, well, we got to do something about it, received from the administration, no, no, they're fighting ISIS. Um, that has been part of this dynamic, and that's probably why uh, there is a still relative quiet on, on this issue. And now we have a, a, a new big Satan. Um, and for the second issue, I think I'll have to agree with Dr. Kedar. If you're looking at uh, a certain way out. It's not going to be a Syria, the Syria of yesterday. We have to understand that Syria has been for a while de facto divided. What uh, the different uh, maze of interest and potentially could do if you want to try uh, and, and get them together is to understand where there are interests uh, in the north and the south and where there are groups that potentially can coincide with his interests so that they will be able to look at this concept which was actually raised again. And also now, interestingly enough, within the context of the American-Russian discussions, these safe zones, whether it is going to be a Lawistan or a Druzistan, or whether it's going to be a safe zone in the north and a safe zone in the south, the concept is that just like ISIS de facto controls a certain part of Syria, we may be able to help some moderate factions um, to control other parts of Syria, to create safe zone, and to use that as a potential jumping block in to try to build mm. uh, the next phase of a possible solution. Dr. Uh, Kedo. These are good uh, ideas. The only question is how do you implement them? And unfortunately, in such an arena, only by force you can implement anything. Nobody is doing anything in this part of the world willingly and voluntarily. And only a big force, a big, with very, very uh, heavy stick, you can force the parties to any solution which 
somebody can draw for so them. So let me ask you this. Is this an arena? As everybody really knows that Syria is not really of strategic value to any of the countries, is it more of an arena for statements? No, no, it's a very, very important strategic, strategic arena for the, for the Iranians, for the Turks, for the Jordanians, because of their worldview. Saudis, we also have some interests on at least in part of Syria. So definitely Syria is a, is a, is a land which many are looking at as some kind of taking part in the next uh, phase, uh, which will be there. Definitely Syria is very important for location, And uh, look, even the water issue. The Euphrates comes from Turkey to Iraq through Syria. Iraq has very, very established uh, uh, important interests in Syria. So uh, this is why I think that all the parties will have actually to agree on something, the states around it, but and this have to be forced on the, all the parties, the local and the external, by Russia, which uses force, but unfortunately the other side, the West, does not use force. Mr. Uh, Owen. We are talking about uh, what happened, what has been happening over the last uh, five, almost five and a half years, as if it is uh, somehow unnatural. But on the contrary, this is the natural state of affairs in the Arab world, where you have tribes, regions, confessions fighting each other. And the only times where this has not been so was when either a dictator such as Saddam Hussein or Hafez and then Bashar Assad ruled with an iron hand or a neighboring country, a neighboring power imposed its will, which is what is happening now in Iraq. You see Iraq as a model, the new Iraq following the war, the 2003 war mm -hmm. as a model for what is happening in Syria, where Iran is having a lot of influence because of its uh, contiguity and because of the Shiite uh, population. In Syria, you don't have it. Now, Syria used to be that power in Lebanon. Syria intervened in the Lebanese civil war, ostensibly as part of an Arab deterrence force. Everybody was happy until Israel invaded. Israel tried to replace Syria as de facto power in Lebanon. It failed. Now, Syria is Lebanon. Who is going to play Syria in the Syrian civil war? We are lacking such a power, and the um, uh, conglomeration of powers is not enough because of the competing interests. Dr. Bones. Well, the, the new Syria in this regard is actually Russia, and this is the, the party that plays that, uh, that role. And uh, to continue what you've said, this year is the 100th year of the original scene of the Middle East with the Sykes-Picot Agreement. And this is where some of this begins, when we have a division of the region to spheres of influence. And if we take that framework for a second to, to bear, then, then we had empires that had fulfilled these roles. They had taken the lead, they had supported, they had built uh, some of the forces, and they were there to support when needed. Uh, at this point, I think what we see is a vacuum that was left by some of the same powers that had been operating um, in that particular time and in America that succeeded them, and the Russians that are filling the gap. Dr. Yeah, there, is, there is another exception to what I said, and this is um, uh, where you have regimes operating under the 3M rule, monarchy, money, and muhabarat, the mm -hmm. security service. So up to now, at least, as we are speaking, Jordan and Saudi Arabia have survived. We don't know whether this will mm -hmm. last. Uh, Dr. Kedon. Well, I think that the world should prepare itself to more of agonies in Syria and outside from Syria, like the, the uh, refugees, which during the, uh, 2015 flooded Europe. I think this thing will continue, mainly because I don't see any way to agree to any agreement in Syria which will stabilize the state and rebuild. Look, you know how many billions you need in order to rebuild Syria, the infrastructure, sewage system, water system, electricity system, transportation systems, all everything has to be rebuilt. I don't see the money which could come from the world, which which that will, will pay for this. This agony will continue, I, I'm afraid, for decades. It will be a hundred Gazas. Mm -hmm. The, the uh, rebuilding of Syria right. will take a hundred Gazas to me. And since it doesn't appear in Gaza, it will not be there. And, and, just, to add, and just to add to that, that when we look into that, who is fighting in Syria, it's important to understand over half of the Syrians have already left Syria. 
And the majority of those who are fighting in Syria uh, or close to that number are not even Syrians. There are people who came either to the Islamic states from outside, people who came to volunteers, proxies who came from Iran, pilots who came from Russia. Uh, and that's also a very important piece that goes into the importance of why Syria is becoming, even if it had not been in the past, a very important geopolitical regional battle. Well, we're running out of time. I'll give each and every one of you the opportunity to give a little bit of uh, their views. Dr. Keda, with a few words, how do you see the uh, situation evolving in the near future? Getting from bad to worse, mainly because of the world who denies the situation and denies to look in the, into the sociology of the Middle East rather than to the politics of the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Mr. Uh, we are exactly um, six months before the elections in the United States. This is the twilight of the Obama administration. He is already joking uh, with the White House correspondents. Obviously, as he said, Obama out. And we have to wait and see whether the new administration will break with the Obama policy because Obama didn't think that the American uh, people uh, we're going to support an invasion or any action by force. Uh, starting January of next year, we may see mm. some of Dr. Bond. And I think even before January next year, if the, we need to give a name for the next season, I think it may be the Saudi season. The Saudis are very angry. Uh, and they also understand that if the Americans continue to uh, stay outside, some of them needs to step in. Uh, and if there are not so many other candidates, and they may... Uh, decide to uh, try and do something that was not done before. Uh, one actor we didn't speak about too much, Israel. Mr. Oren, how do you view them? Well, apparently Israel um, uh, is uh, beginning to feel fidgety, as Prime Minister Netanyahu saw fit all of a sudden after all of these years without uh, anyone prompting him, uh, saying that uh, the Golan is going to be eternally held by Israel, a view not accepted by anybody else. So if there is some international move towards a rebuilt Syria, the Golan uh, Heights will be on the table again. Whether Israel will give uh, a, a big concession remains to be seen. Mm. Dr. Bombs, one sentence on that matter? We, Israel maintained a significant or semi-significant relationship uh, with uh, the southern part, uh, dealing and treating over 2,600 uh, Syrians here. And it can play a part in a, a potential safe zone in the south part mm. of Syria. Dr. Kedal? Well, Israel is preparing a big uh, commando unit to face uh, anything which can come from Syria, and I think Israel is right by doing it. All right. I would like to thank you all, Dr. Bombs, uh, Mr. Oren, and Dr. Kedal for coming here. It's been a pleasure, and we'd like to thank our viewers, and we will see you next week. You just watched Jerusalem Studio. If you were enriched by the program, please consider supporting Evan TV7 Jerusalem. Call us at 0600 10077 or send your donation using the bank account reference number on the screen. You can also donate via PayPal. Jerusalem Studio is made possible by your donation.